Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Hello and welcome to Reloscope, the Relationship Science Insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions in life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm your host, Aditi Kuti. Let's get on with the show. Today we're joined by Margie Ulbrich. Um, she's a relationship counselor um, and also former family lawyer, uh, focusing on couples um, improving and creating better and more deeply connected relationships with each other. Uh, she's also the author of the book Mindful Relationships, which is available um, all over the world. Uh, Margie, thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you, Aditi. It's wonderful to be here with you. Um, today we're going to be talking about commitment um, and specifically mindfulness um, in relationships. Uh, but real quick, before we get into that, I wanted to get to know you a bit better. Um, let's We have a section, a segment called um, Have You Met Margie Ulbrich? Uh, in which I ask you a couple of questions and you don't have to think too hard. You just need to reply the first thing that comes to your head. Are you ready? Okay. I am. Fantastic. Uh, what is your favorite book? Uh, Pride and Prejudice. Jane Austen. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's a classic. That's definitely mm-hmm. a classic. I yeah. rewatched um, the 2004 or five movie adaptation of it the other day. Yeah, oh, wonderful. Oh, yeah. It's a wonderful movie. I, st- I studied it at school, so I think in um, my year 12, yeah, I read it five times. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. yeah so lucky. <laughs> we didn't mm. get to read anything that nice in my high school. Um, uh-huh. What is your favorite movie? Uh, well, my favourite movie is The Sound of Music. It's an old, an old, an old one that I've watched so many times since I was a, a young person. Um, yeah, that that's. I, I, I went to the movies last night actually, and I went to see um, a movie which I thought was very interesting. Um, good luck to Leo Grand. Good luck to you, Leo Grand. It's a new one with Emma Thompson, and I thought that was very, very interesting. So. But my favorite is definitely The Sound of Music. It's my one of my it's my personal favorite musical too. Um, so very pleased, very pleased about that. Uh, what about your favorite podcast? Um, I've got a couple actually. I, I love podcasts. Um, Brené Brown's. I, I, can I? Am allowed to have more than one? Brené Brown. Um, I'm a great fan of hers. There's a, a one that I've just been re- listening to recently called Reimagining Love. Um, that's excellent. And another one is Therapists Uncensored, mm-hmm. um, two American therapists who talk all things related to therapy, psychology, relationships, trauma, the whole bit. So um, they're my go-tos. Yeah, Brene Brown is pretty pretty popular. She's quite up there now. Um, yes. Do you have a famous role model that you look up to? Uh, yeah, Nelson Mandela. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah pretty, pretty big one. Um, yeah, personal freedom, despite being in jail, um, mm-hmm. all of, all of the, what he did and what he, he stood for was remarkable. Yeah, for sure. Um, mm. what is the last course you completed? Ah, I'm, I'm a bit of a course junkie. I'm always doing courses. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, um, trauma and awakening actually. Um, which is one that I absolutely loved with um, uh, Almas, who's the founder of The Diamond Approach, mm-hmm. and Gabor Maté, who's a trauma expert. Um, that was that, that, I've just finished that this week and I've loved it. Yeah, definitely. Um, difficult topic, but a very important one for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, we've gotten to know you, Margie. <laughs> Uh, thank, thank you so you. much um, for letting us get for letting us get to know you. Um, now, I guess we're moving on to um, our interview segment, uh, where we chat a bit more about mindfulness in relationships, uh, which is obviously something uh, that you specialize in. Um, I want us to start off really broadly. What is a relationship? How would you describe a relationship? Yeah. Um, relationship with self or relationship with 
other people, family, friends, an intimate partnership. It's it's the 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 tone and the quality of awareness and connection. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. And and I guess within that, how would you define a romantic relationship? So um, I think a romantic relationship is is um, often an idealized relationship. Mm. It's often, although not always, um, between two people, and um, it it goes through particular developmental stages. The honeymoon period being the first stage where we feel symbiotic and like we can finish each other's sentences and we knew each other in a past life. Yep. Yep. Uh, and then that romantic relationship, hopefully, if it develops into a mature relationship, moves beyond that honeymoon period into uh, recognition, acceptance, awareness of each other's differences, mm-hmm. rather than just looking to be always the same mm-hmm. and being able to manage conflict around differences and validate oneself in response to perhaps my romantic partner not necessarily giving me the validation that I might want. Mm, mm, For sure. Um, Lots of different stages. I guess, in your opinion, does a romantic relationship still hold the same meaning, structure and even importance as maybe it did decades ago? I think it probably does, Aditi. Um, It's a really interesting question because I think the whole paradigm of relationship has shifted so much and it's so much broader now than previously. However, there's still the allure, the attraction of, of, you know, a a person, my person, one person Mm. for lots of people, not everybody, obviously with polyamory, but, um, as mammals, I think we're, we're biologically wired to partner and to find that safety and connection with another person. So I think that re- that romantic relationship is still as important as ever. Mm. Do you feel like maybe like, you know, with the rise of, I guess, dating apps and that kind of thing, do we maybe define romantic relationships differently, even if they're still important? Uh, that's a really interesting question as mm. well. I think with dating apps and things, we're kind of, perhaps clearer about what we want or Mm. or hopefully, you know, we're hooking up versus uh, connecting for, you know, both wanting a longer term relationship. Um, Yeah. So I think there are different definitions. We can have romantic encounters that Mm. don't go on to be romantic relationships. So yeah, I do, I do agree with you that the whole, um, concept of relationship has expanded so much to include so much more possibility than previously. For sure, for sure. I guess, how do you define commitment? I know you touched on, you know, multiple stages of the relationship, but Mm -hmm. how would you define, I guess, commitment within that? So uh, um, in my experience as a relationship therapist, what I find is that uh, two people who are both actively working towards creating a better relationship, having each other's back, uh, being open, available, accessible, all the good stuff in in a good relationship, um, they, they clearly clearly make a commitment to each other. They signal that they're in, you know, they're they're signaling by their availability, uh, that they're, they're present, they're, they're wanting to stay for the long haul. Sure. Um, as opposed to relationship where there's, you know, a lot more ambivalence or there's one person with one foot out the door or Mm -hmm. one person who's being very, uh, individually focused versus relationship focused. So commitment is, I mean, it's such a broad area. It's such a broad topic that there's a lot to say about it, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's, um, it's felt energetically and it's communicated in, in so many, so many different ways, I think, Mm -hmm. either the commitment or lack of commitment. Yeah, for sure. For sure. How does emotional availability affect relationships? It's huge. Mm. That's absolutely huge. And I think it's one of the biggest um, 
kind of stumbling blocks for people in relationship. So typically um, in terms of attachment, we might have one person who's more anxiously attached, who's more the pursuer in the relationship. And um, this is just one dynamic. There are many, but with a partner who's more avoidantly attached, who's more likely to shut down, get overwhelmed by a lot of words, that person withdraws and that triggers more anxiety in the the other person who we're just for now calling the pursuer, mm-hmm. who then actually feels like you're not available, you're not there for me. And then the more that complaint continues, the more the other person feels I can never get it right, I'm failing, you know, um, I'm overwhelmed with the distress of seeing my partner unhappy and the more I need to retreat and move away. Mm-hmm. So emotional availability is kind of um, I think one of the biggest biggest problems that people dialogue about or act out in their partnership dance. Yeah, it's definitely, I guess, one of the things that's easiest to clash almost in a relationship. Yes. Yeah. I think it's really helpful if we can understand each other's attachment styles Mm -hmm. and understand the implications of what we're doing and how we're doing it and how we're affecting each each other so that we can kind of take care of each other's vulnerabilities a little bit more and and try and be a bit more aware of those triggers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How does mindfulness come into this? How does mindfulness impact the quality of a relationship? Well, mm-hmm. mindfulness is huge mm-hmm. because mindfulness is awareness and being able to reflect slow down, be aware of what's going on both inside me and inside my partner or aware of the effect I'm having on my partner can create a whole lot of capacity to regulate our emotions, regulate our nervous systems, slow down, say things differently, do things differently. Um, One of the, the, the most amazing things about mindfulness is I think it helps us to stay curious. It, it can really help protect against getting as triggered and it helps us pause. It helps us not, you know, race ahead and let the, all the reactivity be dominating what's happening. Mm. So it takes a lot of practice, but I think it's certainly very, very useful for relationship. Yeah, for sure. I think pausing and understanding how we're feeling is so important because Mm. relationships are so easy to take, especially romantic ones, so easy to take for granted. Yes. Yeah. Um, Yeah, absolutely. I guess, do you think that being mindful in a relationship is the same as being emotionally available or are they two completely separate concepts? Um, It's a great question. I I think there's certainly a huge overlap. I don't think they're separate concepts at Mm -hmm. all. Um, You know, I I think of examples both in my own life or in, in the couples I work with of people who are emotionally available and they're present, Mm. you know, they're grounded, they're, they're, they're open, they're not defensive. And Um, they're all the kinds of things that happen in us when we practice being mindful, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and mindfulness is for me very much about, uh, awareness and presence. And if you think about the lack of emotional availability, that's, that's usually a lack of presence, a lack of openness, a lack of connection. So, I do think there's a big overlap. Mindfulness, of course, is a practice Mm -hmm. that we can really uh, work towards and work on in ourselves and even practice being emotionally available for ourselves to check and what's going on inside of me and and where does this come from and being curious. Mm -hmm. And that can help as well, obviously, in in a dynamic with a partner. Mm -hmm. I guess, you know, mindfulness, 
you kind of strive to be more mindful and kind of emotions are a part of the thing that you need to be mindful about. Would mm-hmm. you put it that way? Yes, exactly. For sure. Emotions are a big part of it. Mm. What does the ideal mindful relationship look like? What should a couple strive towards in, if they want to be mindful? Wow. What a question. <laughs> Is it um, even possible? I think it's on a continuum. Mm. I like, you know, relationships are a process. Uh, I think that um, just being intentionally choosing to be mindful and and having practices that support that can absolutely support the development and growth of a mindful relationship. I do think it's possible, but, uh, you know, I also think that... Um, all relationships, no matter how mindful we are, can can and do have stumbling blocks and and we can have difficulties and we have to navigate those and challenges that come up even when we're mindful. Mm, mm. So it's almost like it's almost like a continuous thing. Like you can't, you can't strive towards being mindful. It's just something that you just have to do every day kind of as a, as a habit almost. Yeah, absolutely. I think a habit, a practice. Mm. I think, um, you know, it's not like mindfulness is, is the end goal. Yeah. yeah. Mindfulness is the process. Uh, and even relationship as a process to think about it that way, I think is, it sets us up for less disappointment mm. Mm. to be aware that, you know, here we are two people, assuming it's a, it's a monogamous two people romantic relationship that we're talking about working together to constantly kind of stay in touch, stay connected or have our separation and in our individual lives and then come back and be able to be honest and open about what's happening. It's a, it's a dynamic thing a life of its own that, that, that by virtue of the dynamism, it continues just growing. Mm. Uh, hopefully I don't think there's kind of like an end goal where you sort of, oh, okay, you wake up one day and you've got really good at it and suddenly, you know, we're in a mindful relationship. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I guess you could argue that, you know, just practicing mindfulness makes you mindful, even if it's just a little bit, and for sure yeah for sure and like I I really like what you said about how there's no no such thing as a perfect relationship everyone's kind of got their own their own idea of what that means and even within the relationship I would say that two people have very different ideas of yes absolutely in our book um Richard Chambers and I when we wrote this book we wrote made sure that we put a, a one or two paragraphs I can't remember now in saying, um, you know, we want to dispel the illusion straight away that we are, you know, perfect at relationships or that we have perfect relationships, you know, Mm -hmm. that everybody struggles with relationship. Everyone has their own history, their own blind spots, their own vulnerabilities. That's part of being human. Mm -hmm. It's just a natural part of, you know, when two or more than two people like clash into kind of one arrangement. It's There's always going to be differences for sure. Yeah, I think conflict is inevitable. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think if we go into relationship knowing that, that can really help us because one of the pitfalls is to think that conflict is a bad thing. Mm-hmm. And it's not actually, all the research shows that it's not conflict that causes relationship breakdown. It's how it's managed. Mm. Yeah, for sure. And and then how we repair after we've had conflict. Yeah, definitely. I guess going back to, you know, being mindful um, within relationships, do you feel that some couples are just more mindful than others naturally? And why might that be? Um, it's a, it's a, again, it's a really, really interesting question. Mm. Um, there's lots of reasons. I think I do feel that some people are more mindful than others. More couples are more mindful than others. Mm. One factor is that somebody's just more open and, um, committed to growth. Someone's more interested in, in, um, mindfulness as a, 
you know, or, or in relationship as a as a growth, as a as an awakening kind of practice. Another part, another person might just not be that interested in that kind of growing growth model of relationship. Mm-hmm. I think that um, sometimes people get to the brink of separating and. Uh, they look at what they're about to lose and that can be uh, an amazing challenge to actually get mindful very quickly, mm-hmm. suddenly listen, suddenly be open, suddenly be really curious about what the other person might say they've been saying for 10, 15 years. Suddenly that that edge of feeling like, oh, my goodness, I'm about to lose you. Uh, sometimes, I'm, I mean, I'm working with a couple at the moment actually where this is the dynamic and the change that they have been able to make together in such a short time has been incredible. Uh, Three, four sessions at most and they've turned so much around. But often I might have a couple that's worked for, you know, years and years and not able to make that same progress. Sometimes that's because of trauma uh, history of trauma for one or both people has a big impact. So there's lots of reasons. Mm. I guess what I'm getting at from that is that like people who I guess are better at communicating tend to just be or are more likely to be more mindful anyway because they're already, you know, communicating themselves and how they're feeling to the other person. Mm, yes, probably, although... Um, Sometimes, you know, the communication, the the really good communicators who might communicate for their work or communicate, you know, with their best friends or whatever in a really uh, satisfying way and and feel that they're good communicators might in in the context of this one intimate adult attachment relationship have blind spots that they're not aware of. Uh, so that can also be really confronting because they will say, well, I don't have this problem with other people. Like, you know, all these other relationships I have that are wonderful and I'm a good communicator there. What's, it must be you. Right. Yeah. Yep. 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 So it's understanding your own blind spots better. Even if you are a good communicator, you're not off the hook. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So I guess speaking of that, like what are, I guess, the challenges and the barriers uh, that someone might find in being more mindful in their relationship? Um, Fear. Mm. Fear fear is one of the biggest ones. You know, um, when our amygdala is hijacked and we're we're in a place of... um, chronic anxiety or uh, lack of trust, betrayal, previous trauma, um, you know, the sense of safety has been jeopardized for whatever reason in the relationship. Uh, We can get triggered really quickly. We can, um, you know, inadvertently get caught in the cycle that causes us to feel more distant and to cause our partner to shut down or move away or not listen. So I, I think fear is a really a really big one mm. to being more mindful. And how would someone overcome that fear? I'm sure that's a huge question with a very huge answer. But, you know, what what can people do to kind of get around that? Good therapy is a really big thing. Good, I, I think that um, if you get a good therapist who can actually work with you to process the emotional responses and where they come from, um, as opposed to just talking, you know, therapy, there are all different models of therapy, but particularly uh, effective is, is therapy that that goes deep into the emotions and helps process in the body and regulates nervous system and, and, and works with that fear. Um, podcasts, courses, books, becoming more aware, becoming more mindful of what, you know, what's the story I tell myself about this? Is it genuine? Is it, is it um, Byron Katie's work around, you know, asking the questions around, is this really true? Uh, 
you know, kind of being able to notice and get a bit of distance and a bit of perspective. Um, goodness me, I mean, there's a lot that people can do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And talking to friends, talking to family. Uh, doesn't, doesn't, therapy is not for everybody and it doesn't have to be therapy, but just having a good confidant or somebody who really understands you to, you know, be able to talk through those fears and, and, and recognize, well, is, you know, maybe my fears really legitimate. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's very good reason for this fear and I should actually be listening to it. My, my biology is wise, you know, why, where does this come from? What is this actually telling me? Mm -hmm. I guess, you know, speaking of talking with friends and family, I feel like, you know, um, for women, I find that that's probably a lot easier because it comes naturally to us to talk about our relationships with other people. But Mm -hmm. for men, not so much. I feel like they're conditioned not to talk about their problems. What, I guess, what's the best place to start perhaps for, for them? And maybe even, you know, if someone's in a relationship, with someone that might be having those issues, what's the best place to start? Um, when you say that somebody's in a relationship with somebody having those issues, do you mean for that person to help their partner? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. I agree with you. I think, um, uh, it, it, you know, it's it, it, it's not always, but it can be very gendered. Mm. Um, men are socialised and conditioned in our society to not talk about their feelings without a doubt. You know, evidence shows that um, mothers touch their male sons less than their their female daughters as young children. There's a lot that goes into this. And um, sometimes it's actually just the, the, um, the sense of isolation and uh, disappointment for the male, if, if we're talking male, and it can be females as well, but uh, themselves that they come to, that they think this, you know, everything feels too superficial. I'm not enjoying the fact that I don't have enough people to talk to or a person to talk to that can kind of um, break through that edge. Um, of course, a partner can encourage, a partner can say, you know, I think it might be really good if you had a friend to talk to or if you, you know, if you went out and did more for yourself that was more nurturing, those sorts of things. But there's only so much that another partner can do around that. It's, it's you know, the old saying, you can drag a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. There's yeah. a lot of that that happens, I think. Yeah, for sure. I think it's it's a difficult one. And especially, you know, if your fear is around your relationship, it might be difficult to talk to your partner around. It might, they might not be as receptive hearing it from mm. you as well. Mm. It might be another another source of conflict as well. So it's a challenging one. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I I do believe it's changing. I do, you know, in in my time as a therapist, um, which is what now, 15 years, um, I think that, that, um, you know, men are being socialised more and it's more uh, more acceptable and okay. Uh, We see it with our sporting figures. We see you know, there's, it's slow, progress is slow, but um, it is changing. There's, I see um, a different clientele now or, or more, you know, more men that are more open to being res- responsive and, and um, more cognizant of their feelings than previously. That's great news. <laughs> yes. Um, so I guess that brings us kind of to the end of the interview segment. Um, and we might move on, uh, to our experiment debrief, uh, where we talk about a practice or a habit that our audience can employ, um, to help them. Um, in this Mm -hmm. case, I suppose, I know we said that mindfulness is a continuum, but be more mindful (laughs) in relationships in, in, in a way. Uh, so what, what is the practice you had in mind? How do people build their emotional availability and improve their mind, a mindful relationship? Um, the practice, uh, there's so many, but the one I'm, I'm going to talk about today is, um, what I call attachment rituals. So, um, you know, all the research shows that in a, in a relationship, we make what's called bids for contact regularly. 
And those bids for contact might be, would you like a cup of tea? Can I make you breakfast? Or let's have sex. You know, they can be all, they can be varied. And if we don't kind of respond with enough positives to our partner's bid for contact, that, that builds resentment, that builds disappointment, etc. Attachment rituals are around recognising that our uh, attachment system on the inside, our nervous system in relation to this one important person is far more sensitive than the rest of our everyday relationships. We're more, more heightened. And separations and reunions, when we, when we leave each other, when we say uh, good night at the end of the night or good morning at the beginning of the day or we're going to work or we're partnering, you know, leaving our partner and going off to do something different, these are the times when our nervous system needs uh, to get the message you're important to me, I will miss you, I will think of you when you're gone, I'm glad to see you, welcome home, how are you, you know, how was your day. So attachment rituals are things that you can practice doing morning and night or any other time of separation and reunion to really be mindful and aware to set, to basically make eye contact, physical touch, uh, aware of the tone of your voice. They're the three things that, that are, if you, if you think about the baby in attachment, you know, we, we regulate babies by uh, tone of voice. They're there, it's okay, holding uh, and eye contact. So they're the same three things that make a really big difference to the adult nervous system in relation to this attachment separation or reunion. I'm there for you. I'm here. You're welcome here. You're safe. You know, I missed you. It doesn't have to be all those words, but it can be a hug, a mindful hug. It can, it can be just a, you know, pausing eye contact, a, a short kiss, just a greeting or, or a, um, you know, even a goodbye, the same thing, like a uh, you know, have a good day, like stopping what I'm doing to actually pay attention to the fact that you are now leaving or you are now coming back. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that, I mean, that's probably one of the biggest things that people can do to start experiencing change in their relationship quite quickly to really pay attention to that and be very mindful about that. It also stops us from taking each other for granted uh, and it kind of alerts us to the fact that these bids for connection are things that we are doing automatically all the time without really being aware of what we're doing mm -hmm. and if I don't get up from the couch or stop reading the newspaper or get off my phone when you come in to basically communicate that it actually makes a difference to me that you're home I'm really kind of um, sending a sort of a message of disregard. Right. Yeah. So what what is an example of an attachment ritual? How would you, um, like, how would you go about it? So each person paying attention to what they do, how they talk, what gestures they have around coming and going. Right. So, you know, not I, I, I wouldn't go to bed without saying goodnight or I wouldn't go to bed without saying, hey, are you coming to bed? You know, let's go to bed together. Mm -hmm. Or if that depends what, what we, do, we do normally. Mm -hmm. uh, paying attention to an attachment ritual would be thinking, oh, yeah, I am always on the phone when my partner comes in and, you know, I'm so involved in Instagram or whatever it is I'm following at the time. I, you know, I can't kind of take my eyes off my phone and, you know, oh, I wonder what the impact of that is. So um, it can be a mindful hug. It can be a kiss. It can be, it, I, I, I really think physical touch is a big thing and soft words and, and paying attention to our gestures, like us, just a smile, just a, a, a making sure that I'm signaling that I'm friendly, you know, that I'm pleased to see you, even if I've had a really difficult day or you've had a difficult day, ah, oh, we're home again or we're back together again. 
that's what we're um, there's a lot, sort of a lot of different examples, but it's really around how we communicate when we separate and when we come together again. Mm. So I guess the first step would be being aware of what you already do um, and mm-hmm. whether you do it at all. Um, yes. And then kind of either trying to rectify that or just being paying a bit more attention to it if it's something that you already engage in. Absolutely. Yeah. That's so good, Aditi, that um, first of all, recognize where are we now? What do we do now? Then paying more attention to it. And then mindfulness kind of requires us to think about mm, what, what, no, notice what happens in my body when I imagine getting up off the couch or leaving the dinner that I'm cooking or whatever it is to go and greet my partner you know, do I feel like that's something that's going to be easy? Is it going to be hard? Is that, you know, what are the fears? What are the blocks? So sort of working on the inside and talking about it together as well. Um, I, I, you know, my partner could be able to say, say, I, I don't feel welcome when I come home at night or, um, I don't feel like you give a damn whether I'm here or not. Or, you know, if you don't stop watching the television when I come in, it kind of really communicates to me that I'm not that important to you. Or So just first step is kind of where are we now? Second step is what, what happens when we start to reflect on, think about how we might do it differently. And then, of course, third step is, actually doing it differently. Mm -hmm. What are three good things about um, this practice? Um, Well, the the first one is it generates positivity. Mm -hmm. It It just actually puts us in a place of no matter what's happened for either of us in the day or it, it it communicates friendliness. So um, that kind of sets us up to go into a more positive space than a negative one. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second one is that it builds safety. It actually sends very important messages into our body, into our nervous system that are you're important to me, that I I want you, that I want to be with you, that you matter to me. And the third, what's the third? <laughs> Maybe there's just two. <laughs> I think those two things are incredible on their own and can have a lot of wide reaching advantages, I'm sure. So We'll we'll stop it too, if that helps. Actually, I've thought of a third. Oh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. The third is that um, because we've generated some friendliness and some safety by doing that, it makes it more, it makes us each more available and accessible to then um, perhaps have a difficult conversation or to perhaps raise something that might be harder to talk about. Mm-hmm. So it does actually uh, improve things on so many different levels. Yeah. So conflict management becomes a lot easier, essentially. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because we we, we carry a backlog of pain, I think, often in relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, we build resentments and we're always interpreting and reading stories and making stories about, you know, what that means about me. and, uh, And so when we we shift gears from that and make it into a positive, friendly, safer place, that kind of gives us a a much less reactive base then to be able to have those, manage those conflicts. Are there any challenges to this? Now, I know we spoke a lot about fear um, Mm -hmm. earlier, but I guess what what else can people encounter? What other difficulties can people encounter? Stress, you know, um, busyness, um, preoccupation with, uh, you know, difficult children or an unwell child or work stress, work pressure, 
um, you know, COVID and all of the, the difficulties that COVID has brought. brought. Um, yeah, I mean, all the stuff that relationships are up against. Yeah, when you mentioned that, I immediately thought like, you know, if someone's in the middle of a meeting, <laughs> that attachment ritual is probably not happening. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely right. However, it's pretty easy to understand, hopefully for most of us, my partner's in the middle of a meeting, but when that meeting finishes, if they stop what they're doing and go outside and say, you know, hey, good to see you, um, you know, whatever, uh, that, that, that's still the same thing. Mm. Because it's as soon. It's not like we're not trying to make this, um, you know, impossible, ridiculous gold standard of uh, having to do things that are way too difficult. It, there's a practicality around it, of course, mm -hmm. but it's also about just um, recognizing. Well, that's where my person was in a meeting, but now they're, you know, they've gone to the trouble to come out and say, Me "Meeting's over. I'm here." Is this something that I guess you need to set a time or maybe an event trigger for, or, you know, for example, leaving the house or coming home from work, if I mean, working from home is a thing now, but um, if that's the case, uh, is, is it something that, you know, as a couple, a couple should sit down and discuss together, you know, how they want to go about it, um, when they want to do it? Is that something that you recommend? Yeah, for sure. I always think talking about what we're thinking about, what we've learned, what we'd like is a good thing. And to keep our partner in the loop about what's going on inside of us and to say, you know, I heard this podcast and this idea was talked about, this is what I'd like to do, how do you feel about it? That that can be uh, setting us up for success. Uh, versus, you know, recognizing someone sometimes, you know, unfortunately, defensively, sometimes people get information and then they just watch where their partner fails them. Mm -hmm. You know, watch watching, I know, well, you never, you never do that. You never kiss me when you come in or you never, et cetera. Uh, starting to be able to say, hey, this is what I'd like. Can we talk about that? Can we both practice that? For sure. Would you recommend this practice to everyone or are there perhaps sections of people that might not take to it as well? I do recommend it to everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think um, in, in this context of intimate partnership, I think that, I mean, um, there are certainly people who find these sorts of things too contrived and too formulaic and they say this doesn't feel natural and oh, it feels too false. Um, and, you know, I never did this with my family or we didn't grow up with this sort of stuff. I put myself to bed or I wasn't used to someone coming and saying goodnight or, or you know, I'd, go, I'd leave for school on my own and no one was ever there when I – there's all sorts of different stories about why this would feel really foreign to people. However, um, we know from all our research that the biology of the nervous system really settles around attachment. Mm -hmm. that sep you know, we know the development of the infant, that separation and reunion is a, a really important developmental milestone where we learn safety and security or lack of safety. And I don't think there's any kind of uh, committed intimate partnership where this nervous system regulation settling in our biology isn't really needed and welcomed and where to have that felt sense of safety doesn't actually become a huge advantage. Mm -hmm. Based on your experience, do you have, I guess, another practice or habit that could be combined with um, attachment rituals uh, that you feel just work really well together? Um, yes, I, it, 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 I've got the, one of my other big ones is appreciation. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know how well it works in terms of uh, working with attachment. No, no, it does actually. It works really well as I think about it. Um, because often, if you think about what happens, we are um, 
pretty, we can be pretty fast. We can be pretty, oh, thanks, thanks, you know, um, you know, even if we say words of appreciation, often it just is like water off a duck's back because we're so automatic and we're, we do take each other for granted, the, all those things, or we're busy or stressed. So I ask my couples, invite my couples to slow down and really pay attention to what they appreciate in each other. And as I was thinking about your question, and I originally thought oh, it doesn't have much to do with attachment, but in fact it does because what I get them to do is to sit together and um, just or sit or lie or even if it's on the phone, if we can't be in face-to-face -face contact, to actually really be available and accessible and present to be able to say, hey, this is what I really appreciate. It means a lot to me because, um, and you know, and that helps me feel whatever. That's that, that, There's an exercise which is um, an imago, which is a particular type of therapy exercise, which I take people through in couples therapy, which is three steps. But, um, and I can do that here with you if you'd like. But of course. It, Okay. Okay. So the first step is to, to sit kind of close to each other if possible and make eye contact mm -hmm. because the, you know, eye contact is the thing that says, you know, I'm really here. I'm really paying attention to you. And we start with one person saying what I appreciate about you is, and the other person says what I heard you say was and mirrors back word for word, and so it has to be quite brief so the other partner can remember. And so that's a inbuilt in that already is a practice of just listening. And often what we're doing in relationship is we're already thinking about what we're about to say while our partner is still talking to us. Mm -hmm. So this is practicing, I'm here for you. I'm letting you know how important you are to me which is part of attachment, you know, we're prioritizing us here. And then after the person has mirrored back what I heard, the second step for the partner who's sending the appreciation is to say, that's important to me because. And then the receiver says, what I heard you say is that's important to you because, etc." And then the third step is, and what I really understand about that is, so we go deeper. Instead of it being a, a superficial uh, thanks, it starts to open up our emotional worlds because we actually have to reflect, well, what does it mean to me that you, uh, whatever it is that I've chosen to say, how, how does that really make me feel? What's the imp And so we, we start training ourselves to go deeper in terms of our own gratitude and appreciation. And then when we share that, that's good to hear. It's good to receive and taking it in as opposed to just letting it be water off a duck's back, which we can tend to do pretty easily in our day-to-day -day lives. And then once we've had a turn of sending the appreciation and receiving the appreciation, we swap. Mm -hmm. So it's turn-taking. And one of the things I think I've just referred to about that, as I said, was that it really teaches us that I can be focused on you and I can really uh, give to you or receive from you without having to kind of put in my, oh, but, you know, will you do that? Or I can still have things I need to talk about and work on with you, but it's a bit of turn-taking. And that turn-taking builds empathy and understanding and connection. Yeah. And I feel like with attachment rituals, you know, it works the same way. And that saying it aloud really kind of makes it real. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I definitely, um, two things that work really well, but thank you, um, for going through that with us. That was really, really fascinating. Um, oh, good. my pleasure. <laughs> uh, I guess now we're moving on, I guess, to, we've got some questions from our audience. Um, and they have got some questions for you about mindfulness and in relationships. Um, I guess the first one is something we've already discussed a little bit um, in the interview segment, but what prevents mindful relationships? 
Yes, um, a lack of willingness, uh, a lack of, you know, being stuck because of our past, because of trauma, uh, fixed ideas about, you know, oh, this is who I am, I can't change, uh, like, you know, like it or leave it, you know, that's who I am sort of thing. Uh, contempt, uh, criticism, sarcasm, putting the walls up. There are just a few. <laughs> Those are some pretty classic blockers in a lot of different yes. ways, I, I suspect. Yes. Another question is how to be mindful, how do we be mindful in our relationships when we are both busy bees? Busy bees? Yes. Was that right? Yeah. Is the, is the term that the audience member <laughs> used. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. It's a great question again, because it's so real for people today. That's one of the things I find is that the busyness and, and the uh, amount of pressure people are under is to use a common or, a, you know, a word that I try not to use as much in relation to the COVID thing was, you know, unprecedented. <laughs> um, but it's true. We, we're under a lot of stress and pressure, I think. And I think it's about intention. I think it's 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 not about um, you know having ten hours a day to sit on the cushion or, and meditate. It's about actually, you know, we can start with five minutes a day, just to have the intention to be more mindful, even though we're really busy people and we both have a lot of competing demands on our time. Just to know that we're doing that is is the beginning of a practice. So we can, I guess, my answer is really that we start small, start where we are, uh, and have compassion and empathy for that, recognizing the pressure, and at the same time, having the compassion to say, "Hey, isn't it good that we, even though this is the stress that we're under, we both want to do this." And the attachment rituals that you discussed earlier, I feel like a really great place to start because if you're not doing it, it's not too hard to employ that. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, really great question. Um, another one, which I found really interesting, and this is our final audience question. Um, does a mind, is a mindful relationship applicable for a long distance relationship? Is it possible to be mindful in a long distance relationship? It is a great question, and I believe the answer is yes, absolutely. I think that long-distance relationships have their challenges, but they still involve communication. Mm -hmm. They still involve being aware of what's difficult for each other and having compassion and empathy for each other and being curious about what's going to keep our connection strong. So, yes, I think that all those practices that we do with mindfulness really can absolutely help a long distance relationship. I feel like it's almost more important to be mindful. I mean, not to say that it's less important for a normal one, but when you're not physically around, you know, there's no body language to read. So you kind of have to, you have to yes. be there. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I suppose these days with long distance relationships, people do Skype or video conferencing or so still being aware of, of my friendliness and my, you know, gestures and having the capacity to have eye contact rather than talking while I'm busy working or mm. presence. They're all, oh, I agree with you, Aditi, they're all those mindfulness qualities are even more important. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, that's all our questions um, from the audience. Uh, thank you so much for answering them. I guess uh, final segment of the episode is our open mic um, segment. And, and you wanted to talk about writing. Now, you've obviously written a book, so I'm sure you know plenty about that. Oh, yes. Writing is one of my passions. Um, I'm currently writing most days and trying to write fiction, actually. Oh. So um, that that's something that really energizes me. It's been a dream for a long time and I didn't spend enough time in earlier years doing it, but I'm really glad that I am able to do that now. And I loved writing the book, Mindful Relationships. That was a really um, rewarding process, actually about to do some edits because it's going to be republished again next year. So um, writing is, a, is very therapeutic for me and it's fun and um challenging and it's good to tell stories 
what is your fiction book about? I'm really curious now. Oh, I'm, I can't tell you. <laughs> That's one thing I can't talk about. Yet. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Totally fair enough. Yeah. yeah it's, um, it's still evolving. Mm. And so I find that if I start talking about it, um, it changes my process somehow. And it's something that I need to just keep kind of letting it percolate and, and discovering as I'm going what it's about. Partly I can't tell you because partly I still don't really know. <laughs> yeah, I'm a hobby creative writer myself, so I totally get that. The minute I start telling someone what I'm writing, it totally changes course because yes. I get so yes. many new ideas. It's such a problem. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Um, and you also mentioned uh, walking as well. You get a lot of ideas while walking. I do. I love walking. Um, I'm currently training for the coastal walk in Margaret River in end of October, which is the 35k walk in one day to raise funds for Beyond Blue. And um, I'm fortunate that I live near a lot of parks and um, near a river. Um, it's kind of more like a creek really, but there's a lot of natural bushland and wetlands around me. So I tend to, and I've got a beautiful uh, puppy, Labrador puppy. So I tend to walk for a couple of hours at least a day. Um, sometimes listening to my podcasts, sometimes just actually doing nothing but walking and being mindful and processing or reflecting or being aware of my body or all the wonderful opportunities that walking gives you, taking in nature. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, walking is very important to me. Have you ever walked? Uh, are you like, you know, if you're in a relationship, have you ever kind of walked together? Have you found that that's a process that helps you or are you more of a solo kind of person? Um, I definitely. I absolutely have walked. Yeah, my partner and I have done lots of amazing walks, actually. Lara Pinta Trail. Um, we've walked in the national parks in America. Uh, we've walked in Tassie. We've walked in the Great Ocean Walk in Victoria. So we both love walking. Have you and, done the whole um, Great Ocean Road? The Great Ocean Walk. Oh, the called. walk. Okay, cool. Okay. Yes, yeah. I think it's about 100 k's from mm -hmm. Apollo Bay down to maybe Port Campbell or something wow. like that. But yeah. It's a beautiful walk. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, walking is good for us together for mm -hmm. sure. We love it. Mm -hmm. Just just purely it's great just because it's a shared joy. For sure. So I yeah. guess if our audience is listening, <laughs> definitely take more walks um, yes. <laughs> to improve your relationship. Uh, but Margie, thank you so much for joining us today. Was there anything, where, where can our listeners or audience find you? Aditi, um, on my website, I've got my um, counselling website, margieolbrickcounselling.com, uh, .com.au, I think it is. Uh, that's important to add, isn't it? And um, there and my book, Mindful Relationships, I'll show you the book actually. Um, hold it up to, that's, that's Mindful Relationships. So uh, that's me. Thank you again so much. I've had such a lovely time chatting to you today. Oh, thank you, Aditi. It's been my pleasure and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. You've been listening to Reliscope, the Relationship Science Insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Lab. For more episodes like this from 10 different life management perspectives, search LMSL on YouTube, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts and Spotify or wherever you find your podcasts so you can get updated on everything we have to offer. We have a wide range of topics readily available for you to check out. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating our show, sharing it, and subscribing to our channel as it helps us grow and bring you more quality resources. More of our work can be found at re.lmsl.net where you can join our movement. I'm Aditi Kuti. Thanks for tuning in.